Greetings ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ivan and welcome to my channel. Today we're going to be continuing our analysis of the MOSFET based Slayer Exciter. Now in the last episode we've discussed and observed how the MOSFET based Slayer Exciter circuit works and quite frankly it works really well. We were able to pull some substantial arcs from it. In theory the circuit should work just fine up to somewhere around 40 to 50 volts. The circuit is simple and produces significant breakout. Unfortunately, the circuit is not without limitations. Its main limitation lies in its own simplicity, unfortunately. This is because the circuit is continuous drive, meaning the MOSFET is always in an active state driving the coil. While this is good for stability and for simplicity, unfortunately this can produce some problems with efficiency and unnecessary heating of the transistor, as well as potential damage due to voltage transients. A good question to ask ourselves would be how can we improve the circuit? And this will be the topic of my today's video. Stick around to find out. In order to improve this circuit, the first thing that must be improved is the efficiency. Now, the problem with the circuit being a continuous drive type circuit is that the MOSFET is always in an active state, meaning the transistor is always doing something switching. Now, this is good for simplicity and it's good for reliability of the circuit. Additionally, it adds stability as the feedback loop will need less time to readjust itself or recuperate to any changes. However, this can create problems such as unnecessary heating or unnecessary power dissipation which may damage the track. The MOSFET I'm using is the end channel NZF04N60ZG MOSFET. It is rated at a breakdown voltage of 600 volts a maximum switching continuous current of 5 amps and a maximum power dissipation across the device of 30 watts. All we have to do is now calculate under what conditions will one of these absolute maximum ratings be reached. In order to calculate at what conditions of input voltage will one of the maximum values of the MOSFET be reached and which particular value, the circuit must be treated as a lumped model and be subsequently analyzed. Particularly, I'm going to treat my circuit as a simple bridge of three resistors. The first resistance will be our impedance of the secondary coil. This will be RZ and will be experimentally determined by measuring the shunt current. Our shunt resistance will consist of a 1.1 ohm 1% tolerance 7 watt resistance across which the voltage will be measured and our internal resistance of the MOSFET labeled R MOSFET is 1.8 ohms. From the following model the input power will be equal to the voltage across the shunt multiplied by the voltage of the power supply and divided by the shunt resistance. From this we can experimentally determine the impedance of the coil at the set conditions because the input power will also be equal to our voltage power supply squared divided by in brackets the sum of our resistances specifically our impedance of the coil at set parameters our shunt resistance and our MOSFET resistance. Last but not least the power dissipation across the MOSFET will be equal to the product of the voltages across each of the resistances divided by our shunt resistance multiplied by in brackets 1 plus our impedance. Once the circuit is connected and powered up the oscilloscope probe will measure some waveform that looks like this across the shunt resistance. This particular waveform is an example of input voltage 24 volts and a constant gate voltage or a constant nominal gate voltage of 3.5 volts which will be held constant through the experimentation. 
I will conduct several such trials, and from these trials, I will measure the RMS voltage across the shunt to calculate the power flow. From there, I can empirically make a table showing the various conditions and the various parameters on the MOSFET in order to determine what will fail first and at what input voltage will the point of failure be reached. The table produced will look something like this. So on this table I've run several trials from 7 to 36 volts at which I've displayed the RMS voltage across the shunt as shown previously. From this I calculated the power dissipation, the relative impedance of the coil at set conditions, the power dissipation across the MOSFET, the current flowing through the circuit and the MOSFET, as well as the voltage spikes on the circuit. Now from this table we can empirically find where this MOSFET is going to fail. So my MOSFET has an absolute maximum voltage rating of 600 volts. So the voltage failure will occur likely between 90 and 96 volts. However, that is not the bottleneck. The maximum current is 5 amps, so the current will likely fail above 96 volts. The current failure will occur, that is. However, the maximum power dissipation is 30 watts across the MOSFET, meaning the MOSFET will fail between 78 and 84 volts, as that is where the maximum power dissipation by the MOSFET of 30 watts is reached. Realistically, this failure will occur closer to 72 or 76 volts, because there will likely be some side loads on the circuit, which can be caused, let's say, by me bringing my hand closer to the circuit, or by moisture in the air, increased ambient moisture. 72 volts, let's say, or 78 volts, let's say, is still pretty solid for this circuit and this transistor is well suited. 78 volts should give you a roughly 5 centimeter breakout, so that's pretty impressive for such a simple circuit. It is worth noting, however, that the power consumption of the circuit at these conditions will be pretty large, like 250 watts large as seen over here in the power dissipation column and there will be continuous currents of 3.45 amps flowing through the circuit as well as 450 volt spikes so pretty harsh conditions on the transistor and what happens when a transistor fails you ask well this happens knowing the problem with the continuous drive circuits that the MOSFET operates in unfavorable conditions. One way to extend the life of the circuit as well as make the circuit more efficient and slightly more powerful is to use a so-called interrupter circuit. The interrupter circuit does exactly what it does, uh, as what the name suggests. It chops up the on and off times of the circuit, thus adjusting the average output power at a set voltage. One way of doing this would be through a pulse width modulator based on the 555 timer IC whose duty cycle can be adjusted from 2% to 98% depending on the value of the R6 potentiometer. This chopped up waveform will switch the driver circuit on and off 15 times a second and for a various amount of time. Now the reason I'm using a driver for this circuit is that it is easier to switch on and off a driver, a dedicated driver I see, than to switch on and off the gate of the MOSFET by pulling it low through using a dedicated transistor. Although that would also work, but you will risk damaging the 555 timer, so you're better off using a dedicated IC for the driving. In my case, I'm using an MC34151 IC. Now what is worth noting in the circuit is that the IC, the gate driver, may be inverting, so you might have to flip your coil around from the normal configuration of a Slayer Exciter circuit. Aside from that, the circuit is pretty straightforward and self-explanatory. And now that we know roughly how it works, let's build it. 
The circuit is set up on the breadboard. The left I see is the 555 timer. It's using a 4K7 potentiometer to control the PWM and it is driving a BD139 transistor. The BD139 transistor is in turn driving the gate driver which is the MC34151PG. The transistor being driven, the MOSFET, is the same as was in the original MOSFET Slayer Exciter circuit. This is the NDF04N60ZG MOSFET. All the diodes are UF4007s and in order to achieve the 12 volt power supply I'm using a voltage regulator. The LM712 to be specific. Now let's connect the circuit to the oscilloscope and see how the circuit works. Okay, the circuit is now powered up and the PWM modulator is working. As can be seen, by adjusting the value of the potentiometer, the duty cycle increases until the LEDs remain on. Let's observe on the oscilloscope. Okay, so right now it's at about 30% duty cycle. Let's increase the duty cycle. Okay, now it's 50% on, 50% off. This means that the circuit will now only be consuming half the power because it will be on half the time. This means that we'll get roughly the same breakout but only half the output power. And only now is the circuit fully on with only like 2% low duty cycle and 98% high duty cycle. As can be seen, the modulator works just fine. There it is again, set to the low setting. In the next video, we will continue by connecting the modulator output to the transistor pin and performing a demonstration of the output power of the circuit. Take care, thanks for watching, and see you in the next episode.